statement. No. Oh. 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 Maybe it's the other one. I think so. Shall I try the other? Okay. No. Still not. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This one too. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon. C can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah? Okay. So, uh, I promised you a Kubernetes tutorial. Um, so first, uh, a mea culpa. Um, I suggested I would give you hands-on access and so on. And I just realized when practicing with people in a two-hour situation that this wouldn't translate to a one-hour session. So I really do it in mode tutorial of doing things and showing you what I'm doing. Um, but if you want to follow along yourself, either you've got your own Kubernetes <laughs> cluster already, um, or you do it after the event. Okay, I hope that's okay for everyone. Okay, so I'm Michael Bright. I'm a developer advocate at Containers. Uh, containers are the creators of traffic. Uh, some of you may know it. It's a reverse proxy load balancer and can be used as a Kubernetes uh, ingress controller. So that's something I'll be showing as a demo. Uh, just out of interest, uh, what's people's experience here with Kubernetes? Are you all fairly new to Kubernetes or are some people... So, so who is totally new or pretty well to Kubernetes? Yeah, okay, good. The other people I'm, I'm aiming at, that's fine. And, and just out of interest, is anyone here uh, using um, traffic? Do you use traffic already? No? Do people know about traffic? No. Okay, thanks. Good, thank you. I uh, just say this tutorial is open source. Um, the initial version, which was Swarm, Kubernetes, and Mesos, we've run about three, four times. And now this is the third or fourth time after I've run the uh, purely Kubernetes version. Uh, and it's all on GitHub and uh, you're welcome to uh, open any issues on it or just send me feedback directly. Uh, I'm keen to uh, have this evolve. Okay, so this is what we'll be covering. Uh, basic concepts of Kubernetes, um, the basics, um, the command line client and the dashboard. Um, then we look at running pods. So if you, if you know about containers, then you know that um, well, you won't know, but uh, the basic unit of execution within Kubernetes is a pod, which is one or more containers. So look at that concept uh, and running pods and what we call deployments. We'll look at uh, how to perform a rolling upgrade across our cluster and then how to expose our applications as services. There are several ways of doing that, and I will show just one way, which is uh, the ingress controller. Uh, and if this time, which will very quickly uh, just talk about uh, Helm, which is quite an interesting tool for Kubernetes. Um, if you want to do this afterwards, then there is a page that talks about setup options for just simply uh, running your own cluster. The, the simplest way, of course, is to run uh, Minikube. Uh, Minikube being um, used to be just a VM for running Kubernetes as a single node cluster within a VM. There's also a, uh, a non-VM option as well, so you can just run it with, uh, with Docker to simulate a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, just one thing, so you'll hear me talk about traffic and so on. I mentioned that I work for containers, for the creators of traffic, and we're hiring, by the way, for remote workers too. 
Okay, let's get started. Okay, uh, don't be put off by the fact that what I'll be showing you when I execute stuff, mainly I'll be doing it uh, within the, um, the sorry, Jupyter environment. You don't have to worry about what that is. It's basically a notebook where you can mix uh, markdown and executable code, and so it's quite a nice way of uh, documenting uh, things as you go along. <coughs> so I'll start with some, some slides and then go back into the notebook. So uh, Kubernetes, I mean, first of all, well, what is it? I mean, it's, uh, it's basically a, a cluster manager, managing a cluster of containers. Could be a whole data center that you're going to manage with it. The, the principle, of course, is that uh, as we move towards microservices, we've got more and more containers running in our data center, and it's becoming impossible for the operators to you know, take care of all the little details of deployment, and you really need some sort of deployment platform which is going to allow you to say declaratively, okay, um, I want uh, these services running, um, Kubernetes go away and take care of uh, where they actually run, okay, and you want that platform as well to tell you, okay, there's a, well, no, you don't even want it to tell you. Uh, when there is a problem, uh, imagine maybe a, a node of a cluster goes down, but that would be a physical node or a VM, or a pod, a container goes down. Uh, you don't even want to be informed, you just want Kubernetes to just relaunch uh, neural resources in, in, in place. So if you know about cloud native and a bit of discussion about pets and cattle, uh, you know in the old world, uh, all software and VMs uh, tended to be uh, pets. If there was a problem with a the, with the VM, then you would uh, go in and uh, try and fix it and uh, do your best to care for it like you would for a pet. Um, whereas here we're much more in a scenario of cattle where a container dies, then you just launch another one in its place. Okay, very different philosophy where we uh, tend to declare what we want to be running on our cluster. So historically, uh, Kubernetes, it's an open source project that was created by Google. Uh, it was based on their experience with deploying containers within their infrastructure, so notably in the internal uh, projects of Borg and Omega. And they really wanted to bring those same principles into an open source project. Uh, they donated this to the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, in 2015. And a lot of companies bought into uh, that as a container orchestration platform. And it's um, currently at the 1.9 release, surely 1.10, obviously. Um, Just at all. Ah. Uh, okay, this is just a Google Trends, just showing the um, uh, the tendency uh, of the different container orchestration engines. There are more, but I just compared Docker Swarm, uh, Apache Mesos, and Kubernetes. Uh, we can see quite easily that the, the blue line, which is Kubernetes, has just taken off completely. And in 2017, we've really seen the effect of that uh, with some su surprising or not announcements uh, from Amazon. Uh, everyone was expecting them to launch Kubernetes services, and they did that uh, with their EKS and also Fargate services. Um, to me, more of a surprise was Docker when they announced at DockerCon that they would support uh, Kubernetes as an alternative uh, container orchestration to uh, Docker Swarm. We've seen new managed Kubernetes services. So this is where um, you will pay to use a, basically a Kubernetes control plane, a dashboard, to deploy uh, a cluster in some other infrastructure. It could be out on uh, Amazon EC2, for example. It could be on-premises, actual physical nodes uh, on your site. Uh, so we saw new services launched from Microsoft and HPE, and uh, no, no doubt many others in the managed, uh, managed Kubernetes space. 
Uh, there, there are many other distributions. Um, one of the early adopters of Kubernetes was uh, Red Hat. Um, their OpenShift pass is based uh, implicitly on Kubernetes. Um, others have been, well, CoreOS with Tectonic, who have just been bought by Red Hat. Uh, Canonical also have their distribution. And we see new tools. Um, there are many, many tools uh, appearing around Kubernetes. There's one which is looking particularly interesting today, which is Helm. Uh, which essentially is a sort of, um, allows you to do, create whole stacks of applications, a bit like a stack with, uh, with Docker Swarm today, um, but also with uh, a catalog of applications that you can pull down, or full stacks that you can pull down. Okay, so if we look at the Kubernetes architecture, this is a bit small, this diagram, but it's really just to show uh, three things. Um, basically, we have master and worker nodes. Normally, in production at least, it's on the worker nodes that you actually run pods with containers in them. And the master node is the, or the master nodes are the control plane nodes uh, that will uh, monitor the workers and distribute tasks to the workers. There's also um, some sort of distributed key value store, so uh, uh, etcd, uh, which is used to manage the config of your cluster and in particular to say which of those masters, we have, there's only one here in this diagram, uh, which of them will be the leader. And so this is something that uh, I, I don't know to what size Kubernetes clusters scale today, um, but essentially, yes, we're talking about you might have a whole data center or you might have several clusters in a data center. So if we look just a bit closer at the master nodes, uh, there are three main uh, components within a master node, uh, apart from the etc. De daemon itself. Uh, the API server, so most things you'll do with Kubernetes will be either using command line tool uh, like kubectl um, or the, the dashboard or some other application built on the API. That is the way that, you, that an operator will interact with the cluster. There's a scheduler and a controller. So as I said, Kubernetes is very much based on uh, the idea of uh, declaring what you want to be running on your cluster. It's very much a declarative approach. And in the same way, the controller um, is actually, I think about 50 software control loops, each of which are checking some particular aspect. And they notice a discrepancy. Let's say uh, you, you've declared that you want 10 replicas of the Apache web service. For some reason, there are only nine. Uh, a pod has died or a node has gone down and so on. The controller will detect that and it will tell the scheduler, okay, we need uh, one more uh, Apache web service. The scheduler then, uh, based on constraints, if there are any, will then decide where that new Apache web server should be deployed on which worker node. Are there any questions about that? So if we look at the worker nodes, a um, few more elements in there. So the main contact point is the kubelet. Um, so this manages the API that the master node will use to talk to the worker nodes. Obviously, there's a container engine. Uh, so typically today, it's, uh, it's Docker. Um, but Rocket is already supported and we're seeing the creation of uh, new container engines. So there is a specification, the CRI, um, Container Runtime Interface, uh, which is also being used by, by Docker already. And Red Hat have created one instantiation of that CRIO, um, which then provides a new container runtime. So we will see choice in that area. Uh, the Kube proxy, so, um, well, no, then to wipe pods first. So the pods, as I say, are one or more containers in each pod. They are on a separate network. So to get access to 
the actual application that's running those pods. Uh, the queue proxy is the one that will provide the routing onto those internal networks. Uh, there are various add-ons like Cube DNS to to do uh, service allow service discovery and so on. And there's uh, the dashboard, which itself uh, is is an add-on. And in fact, um, all of those elements themselves can can run in containers on a Cube system, as we will see. So the pods. Um, I said one or more containers. So the philosophy, just as like with containers, the philosophy is really to have one or more containers in a pod. Uh, in a pod, oh, sorry, I meant one or more process in a container. Uh, in the same way, a pod will have one or more containers in it. But the idea is that you should have you know, one principal functionality provided by this pod. And the, if there are other containers, then they should be providing some supporting function to that main container. So, for example, I don't know, could be um, an Apache web server, again, and maybe another container which is maybe uh, FluentD, maybe doing some distributed logging to, to elsewhere. Um, or another good example for a web server, uh, you might have a container which is doing uh, a, a Git repo sync. So it would be pulling from a Git repo any updates which are actually the static content of the website that you're serving up. Okay. So those are the two quite distinct functionalities, but the, the Git repo is supporting the main web server functionality. And those containers, okay, share namespaces. Um, so these will have different process IDs within them. Uh, they will have the same uh, IP address. Uh, they're, they're sharing the same IP address and they mustn't use the same ports and so on. So it's an abstraction which is a little bit like a machine, in fact, conceptually. Oh, an important point is, as I say, you know, a pod will be one main functionality and then some supporting functionality but really tightly linked. And the idea is that as you scale, this is the minimum functionality that you want to scale. I want to uh, scale from 10 to 20 web servers. Well, I need, let's say, the, the Git repo associated with each of those. Okay. So we've seen in a moment the command line client. I've had a bad habit of uh, working from the command line all the time. Um, but I should try and uh, come back to the dashboard as much as possible because it's a, a pretty nice uh, dashboard. Uh, so let me, rather than show you slides here, let me uh, actually launch that dashboard. So, um, okay, Kubernetes dashboard, first thing to notice is uh, within our cluster, uh, we have three namespaces. Uh, when we run, uh, we can create new namespaces, of course. When we run uh, new pods, by default, they will obviously go into the default namespace, so which is empty for the moment. I've not created anything. Um, other namespaces are Kube Public and Kube System. In fact, if we, we can change into Kube System. And there we see already that there are some things deployed. Uh, Kube DNS, Kube dash Dashboard. So the dashboard is showing itself in the system there. We can interrogate, obviously, the number of, uh, well, replica sets, which I haven't presented as a concept, and pods. So in fact, all that, 
uh, is a set of pods that represent our Kubernetes cluster itself. And in this example, I'm running an A3 node system, one master and two worker nodes. I'll go back there and uh, oh, it's like I didn't do cleanup. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so as I mentioned. Uh, for this part of the lab, um, I'll be working with this three-node cluster. Um, it, it's actually a compli complicated environment, so later when doing ingress control, I, I will switch to another Minikube-based environment. Uh, but I wanted to show a bit uh, working in multi-node. Multi okay. So... Um, Let me just do some cleanup. So I, I see I did still have some things running. Okay, oops. An advantage of the notebook is that it keeps a historic of everything I've done, so it allows me to archive with the whole tutorial, but to run it be better I, I clear stuff. So, um, so I mentioned the command uh, kubectl. Uh, normally I'd spend, or, or kubectl, uh, normally I'd spend time just showing a bit the options of that, but I really want to try and keep them to, to one hour. Uh, so I do a kubectl get all. So basically with get we can interrogate services, deployments, replica sets, and so on, which we'll be seeing in a moment. Uh, if we do all, it will give us those types of resources uh, from the from the start. Okay. So, if we look at the most basic way of starting pods in a Kubernetes cluster, uh, the, the quick and dirty is kubectl run, and what this does behind the scenes is it creates something called a deployment itself creates a, a replica set and then we'll create pods that will actually implement our application. So what are these concepts? Well, the deployment represents essentially um, a deployment, so the deployment of a particular version of an application. And we see that when we do a rolling upgrade, uh, this is the resource that, that will take care of upgrading from one version of an application to another. Uh, it creates a, a replica set um, which is responsible for obviously creating the number of replicas that we've asked for. Um, and in this case, I specified replicas equal two, so we have two pods. Of course, a lower level than each pod will have one or more containers. Okay, so I'm going to do Enlarge that a little. I'm going to do a, a cube run of this image, of this image, KU8S, K8S demo, um, colon one. So the colon one is standard uh, Docker image notation saying it's version one of this, this image. Um, this is basically going to create a deployment called the same thing. K8S uh, demo. I'm going to apply label. I haven't talked about the concept of labels. It's something that's very important in Kubernetes. Essentially, you can uh, Kubernetes already applies labels to various resources, and you can explicitly apply labels. And it's a way of marking things. So, uh, for example, uh, if you're running uh, on the same cluster, you're running. Uh, 
development uh, pods, uh, test pods, staging pods, and production pods. I don't recommend it, but if, if that's what you're doing, then you could label, okay, I'm launching this just as a test, and I, I would say, you know, um, I don't know, status equals test or something. And it would be a way of later, if I wanted to just clean up, I could delete just the test pods, for example, not touching my uh, production environment. Generally, labels are really useful. I mean, uh, another thing is uh, imagine the nodes in your cluster. Uh, you might have nodes with particular physical properties. Uh, you might have nodes that have uh, a GPU graphics card, which is particularly good for the high intensive uh, compute operations. Uh, you might have nodes that have SSDs, others that have hard disk drives, and they, they would be. Um, useful for different types of applications, okay? And so you could use labeling uh, to then select and say when you run a pod, say, okay, I want to run this only on nodes that have uh, a GPU. Anyway, just to explain labels. Uh, as before, I will say um, we want two replicas and I want the pod to expose port 8080. I'm going to do a kubectl get all immediately behind that just to grab it in an intermediate state. Okay. So that first line uh, deployment ktest demo created, uh, that's the output of the run command. And then the get all uh, curiously uh, lists the deployments twice and the replica sets twice. But so I'll start looking from here. Uh, so it's launched a deployment. It says here, uh, desired to. So it's saying that basically uh, we want, uh, I think that's uh, pods rather than containers at this level. Um, we've declared that we want two rec replicas of this pod. There are currently two. It's already launched them. They're up to date, ah, but zero are available. Uh, similarly, at the level of the replica set, uh, there are two of them desired and, and present, but, don't, but zero already. If you look at the pod, we can see why. Uh, it's in the status container creating. So typically, it's actually pulling the Docker image off the Docker Hub. Uh, probably not the case in this, uh, this example, because I'd already uh, done that. But still, there's a little time of container creation. And here, the ready, we have zero of one. Uh, it's actually telling us that's zero containers out of one desired. That particular pod uh, specifies only one container. Okay, I'm going to run that command again, which will be basically the same. Most prompts. Except this. Now we see uh, two available, two ready, and of course uh, both pods are running with one container out of one. Okay. So just to show an example of the sort of output you get with uh, kubectl. Uh, we can also uh, explicitly interrogate the pods, deployments, and so on. And with uh, get pods, taking the option wide, we get just a little more information we had to hear before. Uh, this is the IP address of the pod that was created. And this is obviously the node on which the pod was assigned. So uh, normally, you run pods only on the worker nodes. Um, though if this was a single node cluster, we would only have a master. Uh, so for development purposes, you can taint a node, uh, allowing that to, to run pods as well. But if you were to scale to 10 pods here, we would see that they would all be distributed across uh, the worker nodes, node 1 and node 2. Uh, interesting as well, let me just 
I do... Ah, okay. Hi, I can see the nodes we have here. What I'm going to do... So there's a command called describe, uh, which gives um, much, much more detailed information, a lot of information. If I look at those nodes, um, we can see the actual IP address of the nodes themselves. And we can see that, um, well, I know that these are slash 16 subnets. Uh, knowing that, we can see that these are on a different subnet than the pods. And in fact, uh, I think that every deployment we create and creates uh, a new subnet specifically to those pods. OK. So how can we access our applications? Um, I'm going to use that information uh, about the IP address of the pods. Again, this, this is not how you do it, but I'm working through to the different ways of accessing your application. Uh, given that we have the IP address of the pods with a bit of bash magic, uh, we can pull out those IP addresses. Okay. And then we can do a, a curl on the port 88 Jeep that we were exposing. Okay, so this is what we get. And the other one. Uh, can't, can't see both, but basically that's, that's a different container name from the other one. Um, okay, what happens if a pod dies? So I say, well, you know, we will automatically not launch another one. So I'm just going to get the ID of the first one of those pods. Okay. And now I'm going to delete that pod. I do quickly get pods behind it just to show, okay, we're in this intermediate state. So that first one ending in S5 is already in the terminating state. It's not quite finished yet. And we can see that obviously the, uh, the controller has detected that that pod is going down. Uh, well, actually, would even know from the schedule. Um, and it's creating another container in the place. And a lot of the operations that would happen within Kubernetes will be on this basis of you want to make a change, or well, you actually just you know, kill the existing uh, pods and launch others in the place. And we'll see that with uh, rolling upgrades. Yeah. OK. So now we just have two nodes again, um, but one of them, the new one, has only been running for 49 seconds. Oh, Okay, so we've seen how to launch pods via a deployment and replica set. Um, actually, cu cutting down the tutorial to one hour, just one point that I didn't mention is, so I've been creating those from just a kubectl run command. That, that is the quick and dirty method. Um, the way you would create resources, and we'll see it a bit later, is we tend to put those in a, a YAML file um, to actually, again, declare the overall set of resources that you want for your system. And we would actually do a kubectl uh, create or apply of that YAML file. Which, which is quite nice because you can also, on the other hand, when you want to stop things, you can do a kubectl and delete. Or if you want to modify parameters, you do a kubectl apply. Okay. Uh, so, when we start doing stuff here, I'm going to use a different cluster. Uh, it's, it's no longer this multi-node cluster. It's just a, a, a mini-cube, single-node mini-cube. And I'm going to show other ways of accessing our application. Obviously, uh, what I just showed, I was accessing the pod directly. That, that's no good. Um, I had to know 
uh, the IP address of a particular pod to access it, access it, and also I was accessing directly an internal network, so that's a no-no. So let's look at how we can use services to expose those pods. So basic principle is you will have a service which is going to expose one or more IP addresses, one or more ports, so that some external user can get to those pods, okay? And there are different ways of doing that. And it's important as well, not just because um, users shouldn't have access to a pod which is internal, uh, but as well because of this whole nature of when we change things, pods will come and go. Uh, we can't keep track of those pod IP addresses. Okay, so there are, there are many ways actually, um, but at least a couple I haven't listed here. These are maybe three most interesting ways of creating a service to access um, uh, our, our application. Uh, the first one is NodePort. Um, well, I'll, I'll skip to the following slide. So the idea of NodePort is uh, that you will expose the IP address uh, of each worker node and a particular port that will be used to access one application. Okay, so well, yeah, but that means okay, you don't have to know the addresses of the pods anymore. You don't have to access that internal network, but you still have to know the address of the worker node, which might go away and be replaced by another one. Uh, and it's also no doubt an internal network as well. Uh, so that's really something that can be useful maybe for internal testing or something, uh, but probably not something you'd want to use uh, in production. Uh, as it says here, then, yeah, you'd also be using uh, one port for each service to expose. It's also in this 30,000 upwards uh, range. There are some disadvantages, but it's, it can be useful for testing. Uh, another way is load balancer. Uh, so typically, if you create a cluster on uh, GKE, the, the Google Kubernetes engine, um, you could use this method, and uh, an external load balancer will be created for you automatically, and you can use that. And that's um, that's sort of like the advantage or disadvantage of this. It's great when you're running in some cloud provider and they will provide this external load balancer for you. Uh, and this will provide you an IP address, um, a known IP address, and this will no doubt be on some safe uh, subnet that you, you do uh, accept to expose. And then it, it will load balance between the worker nodes, or between the pods, I should say. So this is good for, for deployment. But there's a third way, that's the one I want to present to you, which is to have a Kubernetes ingress controller. <clears throat> and this one uh, provides more functionalities. So it will provide uh, like public uh, addresses you can use to get in to the services running in the pods. Uh, the thing is that you will no doubt be having a large number of services in your cluster and it becomes complicated to route between them. Uh, the concept of Ingress Controller allows to do uh, different types of routing to get to those services, like path-based routing. So we've seen an example where, uh, based on the host name that we attack, we will be directed to a different service, and it's the Ingress Controller that will provide us that functionality. Okay, so traffic, oh, traffic um, is an example of a reverse proxy load balancer that can be used as an ingress controller. And so I will use that uh, in a demo. Traffic allows quite extensive uh, combinations of uh, host name, uh, path prefix, so the sort of URL path, um, and port based routing to be able to direct to different services within your cluster. Uh, it also allows to do um, 
hot reloads of the configuration. You don't have to restart traffic if you uh, reconfigure it to add another service or to change an existing service. And it also has uh, less encrypted support, so it can actually uh, do uh, or automated uh, in encryption. Uh, Okay. Uh, so I'm going to go away from this um, previous dashboard. I'm going to close that. Okay, so this is uh, Kubernetes dashboard of another Kubernetes cluster. So I said this one is based on Minikube. So we should see here it has just a single, a single node. Okay. Uh, I think I have nothing running. Let me, uh, let me check that. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to show how to uh, deploy traffic itself uh, as an ingress controller. For the moment, I didn't show you explicitly. Again, if I cleaned up properly, um, yeah. Ah, no, I didn't clean up properly apparently. Uh, okay, let me. Uh, okay. Okay, so I just got a, a scripted demo, and I'll talk you through the different steps. Uh, so I'm going to install traffic itself, and we see that's quite simple to do with the appropriate YAML file. Uh, I'm going to deploy some pods uh, of an application that shows cheeses, as you'll have seen. Uh, traffic is really into cheeses. And um, I will deploy a service for those different applications. For those, those, yeah. And then I will uh, set up different paths to those services. Okay. So the first step I won't show the actual YAML files there. Or, no. um, I've actually applied the configuration to install traffic. And now I'm going to create my, my applications, my, my services. Okay, so we have, um, I'm looking for the image. We have an application called Cheese. Uh, I'm going to deploy that. Okay, so I've deployed three services, actually all based on the, the same image, uh, called Stilton, Cheddar, and Wensleydale. And we can see that uh, those three services are running now. Okay, actually still have, okay, something wasn't cleaned up properly. So I have uh, an ingress running, hope that isn't going to create this problem. So I'll get an error here, I think, because the ingress is already created. Uh, okay. So actually it might work better than before. So let me come clean. I have a working version of this demo, and it was the first time I installed it myself. So this may or may not work. If it doesn't work, I'll switch to the working version that I already had. But it would be really cool if this works. Hold on, let me change because that's not, that's the working version, and this is the maybe working version. 
Okay. Uh, so just to say, the address up there, which is totally unreadable, uh, is traffic UI dot minicube three, uh, and I, I have a, a, an etc host entry with the IP address of that particular node. Okay, so this is the traffic dashboard. Um, I didn't mention that traffic actually can work with many different backends. So obviously Kubernetes. Docker Swarm, Apache Mesos, um, Nomad, Rancher, and also some other backend <laughs> services uh, like uh, Console, Zookeeper, uh, Eureka. There, there are a lot of backend services. What we're seeing here is, okay, in terms of providers, we, we have one configured, which is Kubernetes. So when we configured it as an ingress controller, basically enable this this tab and what we're seeing is a number of front ends so these are actually the ingresses for the services I created now this first one actually is an error this is me trying to set up the system earlier and then the these following ones should be good okay actually I'm a bit surprised by the address but okay and the, these front ends are going to basically route through to these back end services. Okay, yeah, HTTP, it always helps. <laughs> oh, I'll quicker if I. That's fine. I don't normally use that address. Service unavailable. Okay, never mind. So I'll go to my, my working version then. Um, so I'm cheating. Oops. So I'll start with the dashboard of the other uh, system that I have. Okay, and here, th this is more, to be honest, this is more than I was expecting, of uh, cheddar.minicube, stilton.minicube, and the last one, wensleydale.minicube. Uh, so these are the host names. Again, it's the same IP address, but I have entries for these in my etc. hosts. So now, if I try to access uh, cheddar minicube, I will be directed to the Cheddar service. Wensley Dale, okay, and I think you get the idea. But I fancy a bit of Stilton anyway. Okay, so that, um, so I just want to show you the, the idea behind an ingress controller, uh, where basically you can configure different routes. In this case, uh, basically if the host is cheddar.minicube, then we're going to route through to the back end cheddar.minicube, and this is going to direct through to the pods. Uh, what traffic is doing here is there are different ways it can be configured. But it's actually interrogating the Kubernetes API um, so we don't have to configure traffic to say, okay, these are the services. No, it's traffic which has detected that those services are running. If I, uh, normally, if I, if I delete stuff, delete the pods, then those backends will, will disappear. That's one of the advantages, at least of traffic, and it has this dynamic configuration reloading, okay? Uh, and generally, this is the sort of functionality that uh, reverse proxies, ingress controllers will provide, but maybe not with such dynamic uh, reloading. So in this case, it's very simple filtering. Uh, we're basically saying um, it comes in on, well, 
cheddar.minikube hostname with path slash, then go to this service. We, we could do things uh, more extravagant. We could have uh, regex in there and this sort of thing. Um, so there's a lot of possibility for um, quite flexible routing for different services. Are there any questions on that before I go on? Yeah. Could you, uh, you run traffic behind another traffic? Behind another? Traffic. So you have one global reverse proxy yeah. and then each team maintains their own reverse proxy for their set of apps? Uh, I, I guess you could. Uh, I'm not sure to understand the use case, but uh, yes, a lot, I mean a lot of the use cases we have are treating where headers are already been modified because they passed through different systems. Uh, so I guess you could have uh, chaining of reverse proxies. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, the use case was more. It was a multi-tenant So each team is track all the routing together there. Okay. But then there's still a global increase. So, um, yeah, I think that would be perfectly possible. I'll try to remember it as an idea for a, for a demo. It would be pretty cool. <laughs> Okay, if I go back, let's say this is really the, uh, the shortened version. This is the cheap one hour version. Uh, speaking of which, I mean, this is the first time I present traffic. Uh, the second time will be this evening. And uh, made me think earlier of, uh, has that ever happened to you? I got in a plane once. Um, the pilot proudly announces, you know, trying to put people at ease, don't worry, this is this plane's first flight. So that everyone's happy except the engineers. I think, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, engineering, reliability curves and stuff. Uh, it's the same. Um, yeah, my first time presenting traffic, so for you, a few hicks. Hopefully it'll go a bit better for the, the second time. We'll see if I can debug in the MRT later. Okay. Um, so I mentioned, I mean, there, there are tons and tons of uh, tools coming out uh, for Kubernetes. I even bumped into uh, a guy this morning in the speaker room who presented three new tools for me that he's working on. Pretty cool. Um, but there's, there's one in particular, Helm, which is particularly interesting. So it was a company called DICE who started working on this and some of the tools. And DICE got bought by Microsoft last year. Uh, and that continues to operate as an open source project. Um, but th there's real momentum. I mean, uh, I guess DICE must have created the project two, two or three years ago. Um, and already so in January, I think, there was a Helm Summit. So it's not, wow. <laughs> okay, so what is Helm? It basically um, allows you to specify in a YAML file a uh, whole uh, application stack, uh, and then those YAML files themselves are available on a hub. So that's pretty nice. That means you can actually browse. I go. Um, do I have it open? No. Okay. Let me go there. This is the web, the the Helm website. And down here, it's the option to uh, get charts. So you go over there, cube apps, and explore apps. So if I want, don't want to bore you with this, but you know, I could even uh, I could even install traffic using Helm. But you know. But, okay, you can see a whole load of application stacks. There's uh, a command line tool as well. Uh, allows you to do, quite simply, Helm search, uh, Helm fetch, I think it is, then Helm install. Uh, maybe that's not quite the advanced. 
um, but it's a really nice way of being able to install complete applications across your Kubernetes cluster. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to stop there. So in the end, that was a 55 minute version, not the hour version. So, any questions from people? Yeah. So, let me see. github.com container orchestration labs actually then it's um, Kubernetes, no, orchestration Kubernetes and it's actually on a branch FOSS Asia okay. and um, yeah I'm interested for any, any feedback any issues you want to open against the, uh, the tutorial uh, this is a one hour version I mean could actually run for anywhere between one and three, maybe four hours next time. Okay, thank you uh, for your time.